everybody. Well, thanks for joining us for this. Um, this is going to be a very, very short, uh, a really a mini lecture about, uh, I, I sort of zeroed in on three commonplace myths about Badia Masamni, who is one of the really significant contributors to the history of Egyptian rock sharky, aka belly dance. Badia Masamni and her impact on rock sharky. So, I mean, we could do an exhaustive dive into the life of Badia Masamni, into all of her contributions. Um, but I'm all about myth busting right now. And I, I really want to zero in on things that continually get circulated or recycled about Badia and her role in the dance's history. And let me say at the outset that because this is very short and it's just a quick blow through of this, um, that if you have questions about anything I talk about, if you want to know sources, you can either sit tight and wait for the book, which actually pretty much every source that I discuss or reference in this is referenced in the book, or you can email me, message me on Facebook, and I will happily let you know as well. So. Um, I want to talk briefly just about an overview of Badia in case you don't know. Uh, Badia was a Syrian entertainer and entrepreneur, um, actually born in Syria. It gets a little tricky because at the time she was born at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, there's some conflict about the date. Um, but at that time, there wasn't really a distinction in the way we think of it today between Lebanon and Syria. We have colonialism to thank for that, um, but we can generally say she was born in Syria. Um, she briefly went to Egypt in the 1910s. There's a long backstory behind that. And really to read an interesting uh, biography of her, there is something on Shira.net site uh, that is a translation done by Priscilla Adam of uh, an article a series um, that was, I believe, in an Egyptian magazine or an Egyptian newspaper. Um, so you could check that out as a, a really decent source. So a little, that series was a little hyperbolic, let's put it that way. That's not to, that's not regarding Priscilla's translation, it's the source material. And that's the case when you get into a lot of uh, the articles um, in popular magazines about a lot of these famous folks in our history, there's fact mixed with fiction. So you have to take some of it with a grain of salt. Um, but we do know she spent time in Egypt in the teens and she worked as an actress. Um, she was very young at that time, like in her early teens. Uh, she went back to the Levant and started working as a singer and a dancer in cafes and entertainment venues in what I'm calling Lebanon slash Syria. And then she went back to Egypt and this was in the early 20s um, and she started working with the very famous playwright uh, and actor Nagib El Rahani and they actually ended up marrying in 1925 and <laughs> They had an off and again, on again thing for like almost 20 years. Um, they got married in 25, separated within months. Um, and it was shortly after that separation that she opened her first entertainment venue, literally practically next door to his. And I don't think that was a coincidence. Um, so after that, she would go on to open many other places. Uh, she had a short-lived place in Alexandria. She had a place in Giza in, in the south of Cairo. She had, of course, the Casino Opera. So um, very many very successful establishments. But, but that first place that started it all was on Imad Adin Street in Cairo. Um, Badia really the core contribution to our history is she launched the careers of so many of the famous rock sharky performers of the 20th century, the people that really made, you know, the, the, the kind of created the style that we think of as modern rock sharky. So the myths that I want to talk about today, and Tiffany, I just want to do a brief check-in and make sure I'm still good. Okay, good. 
if I do that from time to time, that's just my paranoia because I'm I feel weird. I'm talking to myself. Um, so myth number one that gets uh, circulated a lot. I still hear this commonly. Uh, that Badia Masamni founded the first, and variously you'll hear people say she for, founded the first, quote, cabaret, the first nightclub, the first entertainment venue in Egypt. The second myth I want to talk about, Badia established the first ladies-only program, meaning she off, was the first to offer a show where uh, she limited the tickets to ladies, so ladies could attend without um, worrying about modesty concern, concerns of being in a mixed gender crowd. And then myth number three, that Badia was the first to merge Arabic or Egyptian with foreign elements in music and dance. So I'm going to take these one at a time. And this idea that she founded the first cabaret, nightclub, or entertainment hall. Um, first, the point I want to stress is that uh, there's very clear historical evidence of venues dedicated to professional entertainment in Egypt uh, throughout the 19th century. Pretty much from the time Napoleon arrived in Egypt up throughout the century, there were theaters, um, little cafes presenting theatrical acts, musical acts, and so on. But in the beginning, these venues were targeted at the resident Europeans. But over time, and particularly towards the end of the century, um, so like from the 1880s onward, venues were increasingly catering to the local Egyptian population. So even venues that were originally designed to cater to Europeans started putting things of appeal to Egyptians on the bill. And then you had venues that were specifically either managed by Egyptians themselves or owned by Egyptians, or at the very least, their entire entertainment program was targeted at Egyptians. Now, these places are tough to categorize. Uh, you know, these terms like cabaret and nightclub and blah, I use this generic terminology entertainment hall because you had some venues that were like, like European music halls, um, you know, where people sit around tables and they um, drink and smoke and there's a variety show. And then you had venues that were more properly theaters, like we would think of a theater with boxes and so on. Um, but that's not necessarily a cut and dry distinction. So that's why I tend to lump all these uh, venues together for convenience. From the 1890s onward, many of these venues included Egyptian dance and other kinds of Middle Eastern dance in their programs. So what I want to show you, this advertisement, um, and I think all the ads I have today are from Al Ahram, which is an Egyptian newspaper. This is for uh, April 28th, uh, 1910 at a theater called the Printania. And this theater was located on Alfie Bay Street. I know it's spelled Bic, but they usually say Bay. Um, and that is a street adjoining Imadadin Street. This theater later would move to be on Imadadin Street, but at the time it was located behind the Egyptian Telegraph office. And Early on, uh, a lot of its acts were European style acts and it was patronized by Europeans. But as you can see, this ad is in Arabic and the show that it's advertising is a music show with the very famous singer at the time, Sheikh Yusuf al Manyalawi, and a famous Ney player, Amin Effendi Barzawi. Another ad I'd like to show you now, this is from 1911, and this venue is uh, called Dar al Tamthil al Arabi, which means, it's easier to say, Arabic Playhouse. This venue and is, the Arabic uh, Playhouse uh, was just north of the Esbekia Gardens, and this was a venue um, that was founded and run by Egyptians and the entertainment was geared towards Egyptians. So it was actually the theater of a uh, very famous uh, singer, Salama Higazi. And this show is a variety show and there was a play 
as the main act. There was music during the intermissions, and then there was a comedy show for the end of the evening. Okay, so a lot of the programs at this time were variety shows, um, mixing all different sorts of entertainment. Then finally, uh, December 20th, 1924, at a place called Casino Abusfor. This is near, uh, just off of what is today Ramsey Square in Cairo. And this is particular inter particularly interesting because this is advertising a performance by a very young Um Kulthum. She's called Anissa Um Kulthum, Miss Um Kulthum. Uh, and in addition to the singing performance, there was going to be a dance show by a woman named Fatia Al Maghrabiya. Now it doesn't specify what kind of dance, but it's very interesting that she's noted by name. It's an Arabic name. It's also vaguely interesting though that Al Maghrabiya means the Moroccan. Now that could just be the name. It could be a family name, but um, it raises a lot of interesting questions. But what this ad definitely shows us is that two years before Badia opened her first nightclub, quote unquote, um, there were venues with variety entertainment and there were venues featuring solo Arab, Arab dancers. Um, and last ad in this particular myth section I wanna show you is for March 6th, 1926, at the Esbakia Garden Theater. This is a big, much more prestigious theater. Um, and again, this is Um Kulthum a couple years on, and she made her name at this point. So she was headlining, but notably in between perf musical performance, uh, this advertises Rock Sharky, and that is the terminology that's used in the ad, Rock Sharky in between the songs. Now, and again, this is about, I wanna say eight months before Badia opened her club. So it's quite easy to see that Badia didn't invent the idea of a variety entertainment show. Um, she didn't invent the idea of having dancers, Arabic dancers, Egyptian dancers on her stage. Um, so, uh, the second myth I want to move into, and this is a good time for me to check, Tiffany. Are we still good? <laughs> okay, good. Um, the second myth I hear circulated is that Badia established the first, quote, ladies only programs. And this one, too, is pretty easy to dispel when you look at the Arabic literature, because this was an established practice uh, well before Badia opened her first establishment. And the ad I want to show you is for Nagib El Rahani's theater, which was right near on the same block uh, as where Badia's club would be open. This is 1919, and it's advertising the September schedule for the theater. And what you will find in this ad is they're advertising shows on Tuesdays and Wednesdays that are for ladies only. And then the shows on Thursdays, Fridays, and Sundays were oriented towards families. Um, so definitely uh, people like Nagib al Rahani, Ali Akasar, they were targeting at a largely middle class, but I would say even into the higher, lower class, into those audiences. That was their market, the ordinary people. Um, so by opening up those shows to ladies, to families, it was a broader reach for these programs that were very much um, targeted at, that, at the ordinary Egyptian sensibilities. Now, quick and dirty, the last one, checking my time here. Uh, Badia was the first to merge Arabic and foreign elements in music and dance. So this idea actually, the idea that she merged Arabic and foreign music before anyone else might be coming from Badia herself because in a 1966 TV interview, she says that and <laughs> there's a musician in the interview and it's interesting, he starts to talk and then she cuts him off. So there's some questions there. Um, it's clear this was underway long before Badia. And I need only mention composers like Syed Darwish and Muhammad al-Khasabji who were very much 
into integrating Western uh, compositional modes, Western instrumentation, and so on into merging those with an Egyptian aesthetic and a very populist aesthetic in the case of Syed Darwish. Um, so that was already happening. Now, as far as dance, it's really clear that Badia did merge Egyptian and foreign elements in dance. And in that same interview, she talks about merging Latin, Persian, and Turkish elements into Egyptian dance. But again, it's not, it seems a little far-fetched to say she was the first to do so when you understand kind of the history that was going on before her in the entertainment halls. So first, there's evidence that Egyptian dancers were already very open to bringing foreign elements into their repertoires. Um, it, the pictures I'm showing you, the one on the left is a close-up, a detail of one of my postcards of dancers at the El Dorado, which was a very famous uh, entertainment hall in Cairo, north northeast of the Ezbekia Gardens. I'm gonna talk about that venue a lot in my bundle lecture. Uh, and a few things I wanna point out about her, uh, try to swoop in with my cursor. First, um, she's holding these handkerchiefs. And um, I have found footage of dancers from the 1900 Paris Exposition the Exposition Universelle, I don't pronounce French very well, by the way. Um, and uh, it's a tiny, tiny clip of just a few seconds. Um, but the dancers are very clearly costumed as Egyptian dancers. The costuming at the time was distinctive. So they're in Egyptian costumes. Um, but one of the dancers is dancing and playing finger symbols in the way I would expect dancers in Egypt to be dancing at that time. The second dancer is doing a dance that looks very Maghrebi. It looks very much like something that you would see in Algeria. Uh, she's doing these sort of bouncing belly movements and waving hand scarves. And it doesn't look like anything indigenous to Egypt that I'm aware of. And so I thought it was telling to see in this photo, she's standing next to two other dancers who are wearing symbols, but here she's holding these scarves. And so it raises some questions for me about were they integrating in some Maghrebi dance? More on that in a second. Um, also in both of these photos, you see the integration of Western elements, these uh, poofy sleeves, with lace trim, uh, European shoes. These are things I've seen in uh, photographs of dancers from the 1890s to the 1910s. So uh, they were very comfortable with taking um, certain Western elements and integrating them into the existing uh, Egyptian costume fashion. Last thing I'll say about that, there is concrete evidence that by the turn of the century, it wasn't just Egyptians performing Egyptian dance on these stages. Uh, I have a 1913 Egyptian magazine article that mentions that there were Moroccans, Persians, Syrians, Tunisians dancing, performing Egyptian dance in these entertainment venues. And of course, we also have evidence from advertisements of Turkish dancers. Um, so there were plenty of dancers of other North African and Middle Eastern ethnicities performing. And also that often there were dancers performing other Middle Eastern North African dance styles, often on the same billing as Egyptian dance. So it seems quite reasonable to think that there was already some merging going on before Badia Masabni. And I do talk about this more in the book. So what can we say about Badia? I, again, I never want to diminish her contribution, but above all, she was a creative artist. She was an amazing businesswoman. Uh, she was good at staying out front of the trends. She was on the cutting edge. So what I want to say about Badia is she might not have done it first, but she did it better than everyone else, which is why she was able to make her brand of Rock Sharky into what became the industry standard once film took off, you know, and it was her dancers that she launched 
that became the face of Rock Sharky. So I think that's where a lot of the power of her influence comes in.